This time on Colores. Dr. Jonathan Wolf, founder of the Fractal Foundation, has put Albuquerque on the map for being the fractal capital of the world. He shares how chaos theory shows us patterns in nature. Fractals are the pictures of chaos theory. With the help of computers, we can visualize how fractal patterns grow and turn into these really beautiful things that echo the patterns of nature. Students get a chance for artistic exposure at the XL Projects Gallery in Syracuse, New York. This show explores the relationship between concept and the real world. Our work still seems to have this commonality of like ideas of the transitive state, which are things that are the interaction between thoughts and objects on this plane of reality that's not quite real and maybe even sometimes fantastical or strange. Norm Oberly's curiosity for what lies above and beyond planet Earth led him to build a powerful telescope. I remind myself how bad it can be building a large telescope. Photographer James Reddington found that most people have a secret container for mementos or cherished items. I love photographing anything regarding people's secrets or anything where something that's not readily apparent to people, I like bringing that out in the open through my photography. It's all ahead on Colores. Jonathan Wolf shares his fascination with how fractals mirror patterns in nature. I've been in love with fractals for like half my life now since I was in high school. I discovered them way back. As an artist, I saw the potential for making really, really beautiful patterns. I, um, I loved exploring them. As soon as I got a powerful computer in the early 90s, powerful relatively, but it was powerful enough to make mathematical fractals. I was captivated by these things and just on fire, loved them. I've been exploring them ever since and had some ideas about turning them into public artworks. And it's finally come to fruition. And it's been a really interesting, amazing journey. So now there's fractals all around Albuquerque and it's been really wonderful to watch this vision unfold. What's your favorite way to express chaos theory through, through your art? It's a good thing you, you bring up chaos theory because, well, fractals are the pictures of chaos theory. With the help of computers, we can visualize how fractal patterns grow and turn into these really beautiful things that echo the patterns of nature. And that's really the reason we care about fractals. Not just that they're pretty pictures, but they describe how the world works. So I like to say that fractals are the language of nature. But to answer your question, what are my favorite ways? I love flying over the city of Albuquerque in a fractal balloon. That's uh, an exercise in chaos theory because fractals and chaos really came from studying the weather. Mm -hmm. And as a balloon pilot, I'm exploring the chaotic dynamics of the atmosphere. And so it's an applied science. It's an applied art form. You know, you can turn on the TV news and hear a weather forecast and they'll tell you the winds will be blowing out of the west at 10 miles an hour, as if that were the truth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's not, and we all know that, right? They do their best they can to predict things. But if the wind really was blowing at 10 miles an hour, what would happen at an event like balloon fiestas, we'd have 700 balloons take off and they would all fly in a clump. And an hour later they would come out, they would land 10 miles to the east, right? If that's what the wind did. And what that tells you is the atmosphere is actually doing this. It's swirling, it's spiraling at all different scales, from you know, tiny little dust devils to giant hurricanes, the atmosphere loves spiraling and it moves in nonlinear ways. And it's hard to predict when you do things like that. But because these 700 balloons go all these different places, that tells you that if you know how to use the atmosphere, you can go any one of those different destinations. How does that spark creativity? Well, that's a good point. That's, um, 
it's something I call butterfly power because it's not brute force power, but it's, it's butterfly power and it's small changes. How does that spark creativity? Well, knowing that the system is dynamic and that it's nonlinear and it's interconnected, okay? And because of our interconnectedness and because of our innate creativity, I can have an idea and I can share it and I can inspire other people and they share that and inspire other people and pretty soon it ripples out and it in fact does transform the world. In a, in a visual way, can you tell us a little bit about that math and what, how, it, how it creates pictures, how it creates these stunning visuals? Fractals let you play with equations, tinker with them, and then see the result just right away. The fundamental lesson of chaos theory is that a small change early in a system leads to a big difference in the outcome. And it's in a nonlinear kind of relationship. So I make a small change, I get a big difference. You can actually see that. Any fractal is a complex, never-ending pattern that's made by repeating a simple process over and over again. Nature works that way by doing simple things again and again. But we can simulate that with equations. And usually, when you square a number, it gets bigger. You square the answer, it gets bigger. You square the answer, it gets bigger. It goes to infinity but not always. And that's the key to fractal math uh, in this fractal we call the Mandelbrot set. Some numbers, when you plug them into this equation, get smaller. And you plug the answer and it gets smaller and it spirals inward. It stays finite. Those are all the points that we call inside the Mandelbrot set. They're in the central black part of this fractal. And then it's surrounded by all these beautiful colors. And those colors represent all the points that fly off to infinity. And the colors aren't just arbitrary decorations, they're actually carrying information about the behavior of that equation. Because any, color, any point that's in the same color will have the same behavior. It'll fly away at the same speed. And that's a really amazing insight that equations actually behave like something. They're like living creatures. Different fractal equations have totally different styles. The other thing about fractals is that they're infinite. People are touched and moved and inspired because they've come face to face with infinity. Sure. And mm -hmm. a lot of people find that a very spiritual experience and it's pretty awesome. Why do you think that's critical that as an artist, you kind of create these experiences for people? That's the role of the artist, right, is to change how other people see the world. What's really fun about fractalizing Albuquerque, and making us the fractal capital like this, is that it's not just my art. When I gave this project away and created the Albuquerque Fractal Challenge, what we do is we teach kids how to make fractal art, and we reproduce their art and blow it up big on the sides of buildings and schools and parking structures and things like that. Now there's lots of fractal art out there and more coming soon. And it's like, whoa, we live in this really beautiful fractal world of creative, beautiful possibilities. And people are understanding that this is math, that this is what math looks like, and that we're part of what I like to call the fractal revolution. We're changing <laughs> how we teach math and science, and we're doing so in an artistic way. My goal is not to turn everybody into an artist. That's really not the point. But I do want people to be looking at the world creatively. We've got big problems to solve. We need new ways of thinking, new ways of looking at the world, new ways of appreciating nonlinearity, interconnectedness, complexity. We have all science of chaos and complexity, but we need to adopt that in our culture. Our political leaders need to start thinking about complex systems and chaos theory and applying that instead of using brute force kind of solutions for these big problems. We need subtle, small changes. And you know, that's what I hope is the underlying message of the fractal revolution. Thank you for visiting with us on Colores. My pleasure, thanks for having we're me, Hakim. We're gonna come take part in the fractal revolution. That's right. <laughs> XL Projects Gallery in Syracuse, New York, gives talented young artists their first opportunity for public exhibition. I'm 
My name is Andrew Havenhand. I'm the Program Exhibitions Coordinator for <coughs> College of Visual and Performing Arts at Syracuse University. We are standing in XL Projects, which is the college's downtown gallery venue. The way the gallery operates is that any students at any time, either individually or collectively, can submit proposals for, uh, to exhibit here. This exhibition now, Transitive Flux, is just one proposal that was submitted by these four graduate students and was accepted. My name is Sarah Camille Wilson and I am a third year graduate student in the ceramics department at Syracuse University. This particular piece is titled Small Moments. So it's a number of small uh, elements that are shown together. One of the ideas behind the piece is the many tiny little moments that sort of make up our day-to-day -day lives and the way in which sort of stopping and paying attention to those moments can really enhance our experience of life and that that's really what our lives are made up of, all of these tiny little moments in time. The idea was conceived and constructed as a series, so all of these pieces were made more or less at the same time using the same materials, uh, but each piece is unique. Lives are made up of routines that repeat over and over and over again, but are always different. And if we can give a little bit of attention to some tiny piece of that repeating routine, each time that we do that, it's a different experience, even though it is part of our lives that tends to seem like it's the same over and over again. Our commute to work, our preparation of breakfast in the morning, all of these things that are sort of always the same, but always different, and giving attention to the uniqueness of those moments in that routine. My name is Devanna Wilkins. I'm a second year graduate student at Syracuse University. This is my work called um, Condensate. And this work, what happens is that slowly over a period of time, it sweats and drips water onto the floor. Talking about the human body as an object and also having a relationship to the form of snow and the accumulation of those things and how they have similarities to one another and tie in together. Our work still seems to have this commonality of like ideas of the transitive state, which are things that are the interaction between thoughts and objects on this plane of reality that's not quite real and maybe even sometimes fantastical or strange. The object can function as an external projection of consciousness and in a way that relates or embodies to this idea of accumulation of form and thoughts. Uh, this is, however, the ideal situation for it to be displayed. Um, it has more of a pop, it gets the window display and it can stretch across the room, really interacting with the space in a way that um, it hasn't been allowed to do before. My name is Rebecca Aloisio and I'm a second year painting graduate student at Syracuse University. This piece is called Rays and um, it's one in a series of four. Uh, I do a lot of drawing. It's, um, I think of these as drawings. Uh, drawing for me is this um, process and an act and it serves as an interim, I think, between ideas and forms and objects. So in my work, I really focus on this tension between um, creating a form and a space and also a surface. So in a lot of these, you can see there's, there's forms that are more defined and that are coming forward, and there's also a lot of surface being developed in areas that are more abstracted and flat. Um, and lately, I've been including bright colors, neon colors, uh, into the work. Um, to kind of supplement for line, um, trying to use color instead of defining light, um, using color to define form and shape. There's a lot of layers built into these. I think when you get up close, you can kind of see. So some of them go really quick and, and they just kind of work themselves out in a really natural way and other ones are a little bit longer and more of a struggle. My name is Michael Genitasio. I am a recent graduate from the 
uh, sculpture program at Syracuse University. This particular work is titled Come Back to Bed and it is a more of a, a physical representation of an experience that I find myself constantly in. Um, I'll find myself trying to wind down by the end of the day and go to go to sleep and as I go to sleep the ideas, the creative flow starts to develop and starts to wake me back up. This is essentially a representation of what it feels like to have this kind of happening. I've been you know, exploring these geometric forms um, for taking on architectural forms, for crystalline forms, and I find these, these particular shapes reoccurring a lot in my surroundings and reoccurring in my work itself. Um, so it comes from a very intuitive place, but it ultimately you know, takes, these, takes this form for me. In the future, I would, I'd be very happy if we had so many proposals from so different branches of the college that I couldn't possibly deal with them. Um, I'd have to hire more staff to help me sort them all out. When Norm Oberly wasn't focusing on his day job, he turned his attention to the sky and built a powerful telescope. Growing up in the 1930s, the closest Norm Oberly came to outer space was through popular science fiction magazines like Amazing Stories and Fantastic Adventures. At the time, space shuttles, satellites, and even television didn't exist. That didn't stop Norm from pursuing his passion. It was just, it was just a genuine, genuine curiosity. Norm was an amateur astronomer um, and had been involved with astronomy all his life. Although deeply interested in outer space, Norm never became a rocket scientist or anything as exciting as a pilot. He went into sales with his wife Sandy. They had their own business. Go around to the eye doctors and you take the instruments and we take them and you clean them, clean the eye grease off of them, clean the optics and uh, him and, and, and he used to do sales. But when Norm wasn't pounding the pavement, he put his knowledge of optics to work building telescopes. To build a telescope from scratch, especially by grinding the mirror, you know, and that surface has to be, you know, accurate to a millionth of an inch. Otherwise, you end up, you know, just like with the Hubble Space Telescope that was half a human hair off. But it, no, it's, it's, you know, you don't, you don't do it overnight. So I thought we would record this for historical reasons here. <laughs> so I remind myself, I remind myself how bad it can be building a large telescope. He inspired so many of us as, uh, as kids, you know, to, to you know, pursue astronomy. Uh, and he pursued a lot of people to grind their own mirrors. And there's, there's quite a few students out there that are still grinding mirrors Norm style. Norm was a founding member of the Cuyahoga Astronomy Club and the Lake Erie Astronomical Project. He turned his house into a telescope laboratory and even built an observatory right in his front yard. He built a lot of telescopes over the years and used it um, not only for his own private use but to um, enhance the public's appreciation of the night sky. Why astronomy? It helps us understand how everything came to be. Early cultures started to interact with the night sky and we're talking you know, the Egyptians and Neolithic cultures and, and that sort of thing. It really helped place them within, um, uh, to locate them within their world. It's a time machine. Uh, every time you look at the night sky, you look at the stars, you're looking back into time because it's taken time for that light to get here. So what this does, it helps you take some years off that, that light travel so you can look back further. So actually a telescope is a time machine. In the basement of his house, Norm built a telescope 10,000 times more powerful than the human eye. People gasp when they look through this, this telescope. And it's great for observing the moon and the planets. Um, you know, with a 25 and a half inch mirror, you know, it's not just a typical amateur telescope that you would buy over the counter, say. It really gathers a tremendous amount of light, allows you to see deeper into space. 
So the images are incredibly clear. Um, you know, you can see the rings of Saturn, and when you're looking at the moon, it's almost like reaching into the craters. So it's, it's an amazing experience. The telescope was so large that Norm had to build a retractable roof on the house so he could pan the scope across the night sky. He was a master at what he, at what he, at what he did. I mean, everything was measured out and, and weighed. This telescope is perfectly balanced. You can see all nine planets, galaxies, spiral arms and galaxies, uh, the death throes of a dying star. You can, see, you can see all that stuff with this telescope. In 1996, Norm's light faded from Earth. He passed away, and the Oberly telescope went dark. That is, until Norm's wife, Sandy, had an idea. It sat, and then one time, about two years, three years, she called me and says, Ian, find a home for this telescope that Norm would, would be pleased about. We were approached by Ian Cooper of the Chagrin Valley Astronomical Society, and he said, hey, we've got this telescope. We're looking to donate it. Would you be interested? Here it is. The rest is history. What you're looking at is the realization of Norm Oberly's dream. After decades of toiling in his workshop and after spending a lifetime pointing others to the night sky, the largest telescope he ever built now has a new home. This is the Dark Sky Park in Geauga County. It's certified by the International Dark Sky Association, a national organization of elite scientists, ecologists, and astronomers who test and certify the best locations around the country for stargazing. The park district had to, you know, prove that they were worthy. They just, you just, they just don't hand those out. And it's a silver tier site. It's one of three east of the Mississippi. The night sky out here in Jaga County is a natural resource. And, uh, it's just, it's just beautifully and dark. You can see on a nice clear night, the Milky Way just blazes overhead. I've been out here at night, so we know when they've had open houses and people, oh, this is magical. This is awesome. This is beautiful. And this is the only one of its kind on the planet. There's no, there's no other park district that has a facility like this. County Park District. In 2012, the Geauga County District Park completed construction of a dark sky park. The site includes a planetarium and observatory. The Oberly Telescope is the centerpiece. Between the telescope and the planetarium, we can do a variety of astronomy-based programs. We can talk specifically about planets and asteroids and comets and how early cultures uh, developed the different constellations that they had and what it meant to them as a culture. Norm would be just be grin from ear to ear, knowing that his telescope is being used in such a facility where kids could come out and see the rings of Saturn the moons of Jupiter, the moon, galaxies, and nebula, and, and have everything else, you know, all this interpretive fac facility surrounding his telescope, he would, he would just, you know, he'd just be absolutely over the moon about it. She wanted it to be used for what Norm would want it to be used for, and that would be, you know, educating, turning, you know, turning a mind on, which, what it does. Documentary photographer James Reddington's Pandora Project captures people with their most cherished items. Okay, you see what I'm doing? I think documentary allows a photographer to insert themselves into the work. It really gives you a window into the mind of the photographer and like it's a little bit of their spirit is in the work and you can feel it when you look at the images. I love photographing anything regarding people's secrets or anything where something that's not readily apparent to people, I like bringing that out in the open through my photography. And the Pandora Project was through something that I had myself, which was a little treasure box where I kept all my, you know, mementos and photographs and things from my past. I started discovering that almost everybody has one of these things, or at least some sort of container where they keep their old relics from their past. I had them label the significance of each of the items on the print itself. And I would also take a portrait of them with their box to kind of connect the, the face with the, with the items in the box. I think just that process of meeting people and getting to know people's stories is the best part of photography for me.
next time on Colores. Photographer and alchemist Ian Ruder travels in a truck that is also his camera. He shares his experience photographing New Mexico. When we're shooting out in the elements, you know, just a little bit of wind will shake the camera and nature creates all the beauty, but it also gives us the most adversity and the most challenges. Artist Nancy Muslin has systematically translated musical pieces into paintings and sculptures, creating a unique emotional experience. So I developed a way to translate pitch, musical pitch, into color. One of the 20th century's most accomplished photographers, Roman Vishniak, captures Germany's changing political reality through a modernist lens. And it's an incredible documentation of how quickly things changed. New York-based installation artists Stephen Wynn and Wade Kavanaugh work to recreate the dense mangroves and plant life they discovered on a trip to the Florida Everglades. By exposing ourselves to a different landscape, we're trying to extend the language of our work. Until next time, thank you for watching.